on what the society has been, what the social order has been. In this respect, authenticity and preservation, at least what has been good in the past, must be preserved. The liberal views, view is this, and this is what I subscribe to. Any social order existing at a given point of time is a product of power relations. So in my view, the social order that exists today or what existed in the past is, uh, is a product of something else. So it is not an independent factor. Therefore, it is politics that shapes and defines a social order, gives it a path or a trajectory to change, transform, or even remain the same. Marxist, Marxists would like to use a different argument to explain relationship between a social order and politics. They look at politics and society through economic determinism. Marx had famous, famously said, the ruling ideas of any epoch are the ideas of the ruling classes. So the institutions, the social order, and I've, I've defined social order in terms of social structures, institutions, values, cultures, and of course that also includes religion as well. With this longer preface, let me look at the question of diversity, multiculturalism, and social order in the context of our own history. What strikes me the most is the fact that all other post-colonial nation builders, our elites, like our elites, became possessed with the idea of ethnic, linguistic, and regional diversity uh, was a problem for building a cohesive nation of Pakistan or achieving national solidarity. But this has been, I think, one of the major flaws in state and nation building in Pakistan as well as in many post-colonial societies, that cultural, ethnic, religious, religious, all kind of diversities that our elites have looked at, and this is always a question that is raised quite often in the media as well, that how can we, how can we be a nation when we are Pashtuns, when we are Siddhis, when we are Balochis, when we are Punjabis? My answer is very different, which I am going to give here and I would like to explain a little further. Rather, they consider diversity as a threat to national unity and integration. And what has been their solution? They implied the symbolism of religion, and particularly in the context of Pakistan, Muslim nationalism, national language, Urdu, and selective Islamic history to construct a common national identity. Politics, economic planning, and state building became highly centralized in support of creating a homogeneous nation out of diverse elements. Right? So, two nation theory as opposed to Indian nationalism and Muslim nationalism and the symbolism that we have used, it has a particular idea about state and nation building. My primary argument is that diversity is not inherently in conflict with nation state. And this is a very important point. It just requires another kind of politics to build a nation. Right? The other politics, in my view, is the politics of representation. That is democracy, constitutionalism, rights, devolution, that is decentralization and federalism, and embracing multiculturalism as a way of building a nation on the basis of common political interests. So, you know, in Europe has been an idea of a cultural nation that we always talk about. It. French would define themselves in terms of French culture, British in terms of English culture, German in terms of German culture. So many of the intellectuals and elites have become really impressed that, yes, they have one culture through one language, one historical memory, can't be the same. My answer is, we can't be the same. So therefore, you have to rethink of yourself in terms of celebrating your diversity rather than considering it as, as a threat. So the, let me repeat this phrase. Uh, the other politics in my view is the politics of representation, devolution, and embracing multiculturalism as a way of building a nation on the basis of common political interests. 
what brings diverse communities in India or in Pakistan or in any post-colonial states is primarily the commonality of interests. What is it that we get out of being a one state or a one nation? Rather than on the basis of a singular national culture. I don't deny the fact that, that nations like India and Pakistan don't need a national culture. But then what is a national culture is a subject of evolution and there are many forces that play a role in shaping it. In my view, diversity of Pakistan, ethnic, linguistic, regional and religious represents rich historical heritage of ancient lands and societies of the country. And as such, it must be respected, accommodated and celebrated. Contrary to the prevalent view that ethnic diversity is a problem for national integration, I argue that nation-state building must be sensitive to multiple histories, cultures, and communities comprising the state. I'm doing on time? Okay, five minutes. Therefore, no single template will fit all cases. Any effort or scheme to conceive nationhood out of this context would only generate alienation and conflict, as it has happened in many cases, including ours. We are a multicultural society with many overlapping layers that include Islam and history and geography, bonds, ethnicities and similarities. This requires a social and political framework of multiculturalism to shape the identity and direction of, his, of the society. Multiculturalism, however, however, is not about the social facts of diversity, but about equal cultural significance of all. There is no culture Urdu culture, or Punjabi culture, or any culture superior, or English culture. I mean, this has become as a post-modernist or modernist critique, post against uh, Western, westernization and western modernization. That is not the authentic way of living or organizing society. Every society has its own authenticity, its own criteria what is good for it. The significance autonomy of every group to preserve native language and specific culture, cultural stand. In my view, the source of major evil of intolerance in Pakistan, this is the subject that whole presentation is all about, religious or ethnic, is inability or failure to recognize difference as natural. It's natural. Le legitimate and worthy of mutual recognition and deference. Right? Being different in terms of race, in terms of religion, in terms of ideas, ideologies, or political persuasion, anything. It's not about superiority or inferiority. It is about being what one is. Toward the end, I make a plea for embracing multiculturalism as a social philosophy. We should accord value and respect to the multiple dif differences that exist within the society religious, ethnic, ideological, and many other. The danger is that by denying the difference and space and legitimacy to the different some types of social groups assume power to judge others and attempt to exercise authority and monopoly over truth, ideal conduct, belief, and ideology. As ministers are being hauled before uh, spiritual leaders and ulema, and they want to to have this power to judge somebody's beliefs that tells a lot about which way our country is going to. This generates a psychology of fascism, imposing one's morality and political views on others. It is happening before us. Living through a long wave of sectarianism, terrorism, and systemist violence, it is pertinent to raise questions about social attitudes of conformity and denying respect and legitimacy to opposite religious or political views. Let me emphasize this. Adopting multiculturalism as a core social value and philosophy will generate accommodation and harmony among different social groups and create a social order reflective of natural historical diversity that we have. Thank you for your patience and again giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you very much. Such a wonderful presentation about national integration on the basis of nationalism, which is quite new, of course, for us to listen about. I would now like to request Dr. Professor Dr. Anita Weiss to 
uh, present her views about again the uh, according to the theme of our social sciences conference which is again about Hasina, probably Hasina Khan or Hasina Gul's case which we are going to do. Hasina Gul, the poetry of Hasina Gul. Thank you so much. Adabas. Mera naam in what loud hai? Mene apne baare mein suba introduce kiya lekin phir bhi thoda sa aur samjhaun di. Mene Pakistan aati jati hoon khamas kham chali saal se mene saath ki taab hai Pakistan ke baare mein likhwa hai और आज का मैं पाकिस्तान में हूँ क्योंकि मैं ठकी कर रही हूँ मेरी आत्मा किताब के लिए आओ आपको बताना है मैंने सोचा इधर कीबोर्ड है इसलिए मैं इधर आई हूँ सो एनीहाउ एस आई सेड दिस मॉर्निंग व्हेन आई वाज टॉकिंग अबाउट द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ सोशल साइंसेस इन पाकिस्तान पाकिस्तान हैज बीन अंडरगोइंग economic and social turmoil in the past decades, and especially, is there an echo or is this okay? Is this okay? Or echo? Joe, is this okay? Do you hear it? Is this okay? It's not a rhetorical question, right? You okay? Good? You're good? Okay. So not only has Pakistan been undergoing profound political, economic, and social turmoil, this has especially escalated ever since the Soviet invasion into Afghanistan in 1979, which ended up letting loose a barrage of violence that overflowed into Pakistan's borders. Too frequently, this has resulted in violence, and local people in Pakistan are left questioning the causes behind it. This violence often emerges from religious extremism, which both causes and reflects cataclysmic chasms between different groups in Pakistan. Violence fatigue also sets in as people are frustrated with the incessant fear that they must live with on a daily basis. It's difficult to move forward with reconciliation when the violence remains a constant occurrence. Violent extremism, unfortunately, has manifested in a variety of ways, especially in the past decade in Pakistan. In response, non-state actors, individuals, along with local community-based organizations, civil society groups, and the like, they are engaging in various kinds of social negotiations and actions to lessen the violence so as to recapture indigenous cultural identity and often in very inventive ways. This, no, kidding, Jari, yeah, Piche, 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 ah, Tika, Tika, now I'll put the Tika, Tika, Manzor? Sorry, I came to stand here because I thought that I'd be able, I'd have a keyboard or something here. Anyhow, this, this paper is based on interviews I conducted in Mardan in January, February 2017, earlier this year, and it focuses on the poetry of Pashto poetess Hasina Gul, who has broken social barriers, as being a poet is a domain, especially in Pakhtun society, that has been dominated by men. She has become a symbol of resistance, inspired by war and conflict, including especially the attacks on the army public school in Peshawar in December 2014, its third anniversary will be in two days from now, and also the terrorist attack at Bacha Khan University in Char Sada in January 2016. She also draws inspiration for her resistance poetry from the oppression that women face in her society and they hear how they are not given a decision-making role in their lives. Her poetry expresses powerful cultural sentiments, the kinds that have long mobilized Pakhtuns into solidarity with one another. Importantly today, it also expresses her desire to regain her culture and values and her, and her wish to live collectively in a future without violence. 
So therefore, I want to mention that this paper is part of a larger book project that's currently underway, Countering Violent Extremism in Pakistan, Local Actions, Local Voices. The idea for, the, for my research emerged from my frustration of seeing little being done to counter the, vi the violent extremism that has been plaguing Pakistan, but little knowledge about what people themselves are doing. I'm going, to jump, I'm going to jump over the little back, background on the violent extremism. I think you all know it, and to save some time, I'll just move forward about all the deaths and explosions and the like. But just to point out that since January of this year, there have been over 500 deaths and nearly 1,000 people injured in major incidents of terrorism-related violence in Pakistan. So while we see this violent extremism mushrooming, most people are at a loss to explain who is behind these acts or how to stop them. The government of Pakistan finally launched a national action plan to combat violent extremism following the attack on the army public school in Peshawar. So less than three years ago, they came up with, with the national action plan, which has not been successful in most people's eyes. The plan had focused on cracking down on madrasas that support religious militancy and extremism. And there's a lot of other places in Pakistan that support religious militancy and extremism aside from madrasas. So we shouldn't just put madrasas in that corner, okay? Because there's a lot of wonderful madrasas that don't preach violence. But the National Action Plan includes nothing to address what else is occurring in the wider society? The military has lost its has launched its military campaigns, but with and has had some success in stopping violence, at least temporarily. But my own sense is that how can you fight? I mean, if you're fighting violence with violence, how will peace come out of that? So how is it possible to create a concerted effort to bring Pakistanis together, to reject extremism, to recapture their cultural identity, values and identity, and to celebrate their society? How is that possible? The reality is, we'll, we'll get it together. The reality is that many individuals and groups in Pakistan are engaged today in doing just this. What I've been finding as I've been going all over Pakistan doing this research, I'm on a Harry Frank Guggenheim Research Award. Local people are responding to violent extremism in unprecedented ways. I have found that their own experiences with violence have often produced a deep resolve to change things. Individuals, local community groups, uh, community-based organizations, are increasingly organizing themselves to counter violent extremism in these inventive, diverse ways, completely separate from the actions of the state, the actions of the military, or the actions of global donors. Now, scholarly research exists on what local people in Pakistan are trying to do to stop the spread of violent extremism, as my study is trying to do. Most research has focused either on the rise of militant extremism in Pakistan, or how it's transforming Pakistan, or else con contestations within Pakistan between different ideas about Islam and its role in the country. Instead, as with much of my earlier research, this project is based on close ethnographic study of ground realities, as I seek to understand what's actually occurring through learning about not only what people are doing, but why they are selecting these kinds of actions. I've created a typology that's comprised of six categories into which these various activities can be placed. The first I've termed writing and performance, which you can see, you know, it's either Pashto poetry, which is what I'll talk about in a minute, Music, such as the Lal Band's efforts at, um, at performing at schools, I was able to accompany them to a performance in Bhagbanpura, 
which was amazing. Gulzar Alam and Peshawar, whose music is often the backdrop that is being used when there are protests against bomb blasts. But due to harassment, actually, Gulzar Alam last week is said to have had to leave for Afghanistan because of threats he was receiving. Anyhow, other writing and performances, things like um, the Teddy Kineswan, a Joko, a Lomo Polo, the Pushka Lavati Theater Company in Charsada, the Interactive Resource Center all over the country, and somebody like Gulab Khalafridi's efforts to revive the Rubab as a symbol of Pakhtun identity, and the critical thinking messages found in Creative Frontiers, Pazban comic books. The next category is using art to reclaim space. Painting over hate language in Karachi, like um, Ramda Karachi, they saw themselves as, as guerrilla, guerrilla artists, painting over hate language, two o'clock in the morning, and then putting their stencils on, promoting peace and ideas like that. It morphed into the Walls of Karachi project. Activities in Lahore, the Awami Art Collective, and of course the, um, the Karachi Conference, Islamia College, art students painting peace messages on the walls of Bahalapur, and if you haven't noticed then, the bus stops that have been nurtured by the Lahore Biennale, on Mall Road, Jail Road, and Canal Bank Road that give people a sense that they're important and this is why they're now able to sit in these lovely artistic bus stops that cover them on, when it's raining and that provide shelter in the heat of the day. The next category is communal actions. You can see what's written here. Um, I wasn't going to read it, but now I realize this is the one I need to read because it's not only efforts by religious leaders and others to promote interfaith harmony and understanding, resulting in changes in government policies and, and government institutions and structures. I've been meeting with many ulama and religious leaders. Um, Wendell Kors, um, various activities, including the Viable Village effort in Nosheda. And I want to say Raza Khan's efforts with Aghaze Dosti to promote understanding between Pakistani and Indian children by encouraging them to write pen pal letters and holding teleconferences, showcasing children's pictures in the annual calendar that Aghaze Dosti puts out. And if you don't know about this, Raza Khan tragically disappeared nearly two weeks ago for reasons, frankly, I cannot fathom. Anyhow, after communal actions, there's new kinds of education curriculum, promoting critical thinking, especially the Bacha Khan schools and Zoya schools in Punjab. Next also is innovative usage of media. You said 15 minutes. No, it's not, it's five minutes yet. I can do addition. We started at 3.30, it's not possible. Anyhow, innovative usage of media and news reporting, and then finally activities to take back cultural spaces. For this talk, as it fits in with the conference theme, I'm going to discuss the poetry of Hasina Gul. There's a new generation of Pashto poets who have grown up directly opposing violence. And she is definitely one of them who is considered to be very important. With violence and suicide bombing surrounding them, poets throughout Khyber Pakhtunkhwa are speaking out in their poetry against hypocrisy, power, and oppression. She has broken social barriers, by be, as I said before, by becoming a famous poet, as this is a domain especially dominated by men. She sees herself as a symbol of resistance today. She told me that when she began writing poetry, it was about love and romance, but that was short-lived. As tragic events unfurled in her area, the inspiration for her poetry then became war and conflict. She also draws inspiration from the challenges women confront. She told me that after the APS attack, she went to SWAT to recite her poetries and said that the people in the audience were crying 
when because they were so overcome with emotion. She said, they said that we are peace loving too, and they have had it with war and conflict. They said we don't just want this for SWAT, but we want this for the whole world. Ultimately, we want to do away with the concept of war altogether. A great number of people are upset these days, and this was their reaction. These people have to die for a war they didn't start. The casualties of war aren't just our lives, it's our dignity, our children. We are right in the storm's eye, the center of war. We're the ones who are made to fight. We're the ones who perish. Yet they're the ones who win the war. It is their fate to win, as it is ours to lose. Pakhtuns are very innocent, trusting people. If someone speaks to them nicely, they are willing to give them anything, even their guns. This is why we fight their wars. This is the problem we face. So I don't think I have enough time to read all the poetry I plan to, but some of uh, I'll read some of this. Her poetry expresses these sentiments quite powerfully. She writes, I will not tolerate any wrongful power. I cannot call something that is wrong right. But when I look around me, all these oppressive walls, all these suppressive shackles, my lips are sealed and they have deafened my ears. The oppressive society's eyes bore into me, and they swipe at my neck with their claws, trying to silence me so that no one may find out about my plight. They want me to listen to them and obey them, but never complain or question. I wish I could gouge their eyes out and break their suppressing claws, but to no avail, they keep coming for me, tormenting me. They bind my hands and my feet, and they justify it by telling me where I'll go and to who I'll go. I look around me and there's no one I can turn to. I haven't a home, so I bow my head and poison myself because I refuse to call what is wrong right. Sometimes I resist, sometimes I bite my tongue. She considers that her poetry, next one, um, that her poetry recitations affect her audience's thoughts and actions. She recounts that people have come up to her after a Mashida and said, we don't want anything to do with us, to do with this. We don't want to engage in war. We want to educate our children and we want to empower our women. We want to be able to bring about, com we want to be able to bring about progress. So in this poem she writes here, death was something to look forward to when the time was right, but you take people away before their time. We would look forward to being on our deathbeds and being surrounded by loved ones who would give us a peaceful send-off. People would go to schools, they would live in harmony and unity, and strangers were treated with us most respect. I would have been content that I lived a long, happy life, but murderers, tyrants, you have showered us with bullets of hate and sorrow. Please listen to me for a bit. Please rest your arms, for a lot of blood has been spilt. Pakistan recently bestowed upon her its highest civilian award, the Tamka and Diaz, this year on March 23rd in recognition of her poetry. But while the Pakistan government recognizes her efforts, she doesn't think they'll do anything else to cultivate awareness and spread the message she's trying to make among the masses. Through her poetry, she hopes that the feelings she's able to evoke will help people to spread this message among their community. A final poem here captures this sentiment. If a house could be built like this, the dream that you have seen, I have seen as well. But alas, our current circumstances have taken our dreams away from us. But I still dream of that house where I will live with you, where all our desires will be fulfilled. Full of love, I shall wear clothes and jewelry of flowers. Our whole community will break into song and peace shall prevail everywhere. We shall help solve one another's problems together, and the face of hatred will be destroyed. Everyone shall dance and engage in merrymaking at local carnivals. It will be the season of adorning yourself in henna, dupattas, and chadras. It's the dream of Bacha Khan. It is the vision of Samad Khan. It is greater Afghanistan. 
So in conclusion, I just want to say, in conclusion, I just want to say that writing poetry that enables people to process the violence occurring around them and, when, and empowering these same people to stand up in opposition to that violence <coughs> is formidable. This kind of action affects people's mindsets, enabling them to make choices to stand up for their society and against violent extremism. There's many other poets, there's many other social activists I could discuss, but time constraints prevent me from doing so. But importantly, most of these people are doing these actions with no expectation or support or assistance from either the government of Pakistan or from the military. State actors could learn important lessons from these non-state actors' playbooks. It's not about wiping out opposition, but transforming how people think about their own society. Perhaps violent extremists are too caught up in the trope they believe, but people surrounding them can envision an alternative future and not support the extremists' rants. Indeed, a Mashaida can have an extraordinarily powerful impact in the long term more than guns, prison sentences, or other forms of punishment. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for your presentations. My question is directed to Dr. Anita. I'm from Russia University of Pakistan English Department. I'm from Russia University Department of English. And my question is, what made you interested in getting to know more about Pakistani culture or extremism? And what's the specific reason that made you come here to Pakistan 40 years before? Okay. Yes, Malcolm Odell. My question, uh, Professor, is given your uh, interest in this whole subject uh, and your, your call for return of multiculturalism, all very, very sound, very mysterious as to where it's disappeared, how you trace the uh, degeneration of this concept from the days of Jinnah? Seems to me what you said today would could have well have been said by Jinnah. Uh, and, and he was very much committed to these same ideals as the founding father. How did Pakistan drift away from his, the founding father's vision to this point right now? Uh, and what can be done to bring it back to that vision of his? Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Welcome to Pakistan. Uh, I want to make some comments and one question. My question is, uh, my comment is, our first hope was after our independence was Liyakat Ali Khan. He was our first hope. After our... We don't have much time. That's why we're doing it like this. Please just ask the question. Just two comments. No. And one we don't have time. We just want your question, please. My Never question mind. is, Never mind. isn't you, you the elites of Americans who pushed the Pakistan from, uh, from a liberal society towards the extremist society? I personally feel that these are the Americans who pushed our generation from a liberal generation to extremist generation. I think I will answer the first question about why Anita became interested in Pakistan. Uh, she has devoted um, her entire career to understanding and studying Pakistan and that is very remarkable. I met her the first time when I went to Berkeley on a fellowship in 1984. 
that is, uh, you know, 33 years back. That's right. <laughs> I was young. 30. And I think I was young too. So <laughs> I had done a PhD at the age of 34, 81, and that was my first fellowship. And um, I've known her since then. She has studied um, inner city, wild city in Pakistan. You know, I am really surprised that why wouldn't uh, students of social sciences and humanities not know Anita Weiss? Uh, she has written about three, four books, tens of seven, seven books, right? So quite remarkable. Uh, I don't think this question that why somebody got interested. Um, there is a tremendous interest in area studies, and there is tremendous interest in in subcontinent and our rich uh, history and, and culture. So I have learned a lot about Pakistan from Anita. And actually my understanding of Pakistan is much sharper by reading those in the, in the US academia who have written extensively on Pakistan. About, uh, thank you very much for, for being a friend and being, um, being the expert on Pakistan. Thank you very much. Uh, how Pakistan can get out of the present trouble and the question of multiculturalism. I mean, actually, if you, if you, if you look at um, popular society at grassroots level, we have a strong sense of communitarianism, a strong sense of belonging to communities. The, the, the issue is, actually, it goes back to communalization of politics during the independence movement and they will not enable those people to do what they're doing. You hear that somebody is going over to the dark side, you do something about it, you engage with them. This is what has so impressed me about what Creative Frontiers has been doing in their Pazban comic book series, because it's about a group of students, college students, and one person stops showing up, up at class and then they go after him and they talk with him about because he's about to go off to fight the jihad. But what's really interesting then is Creative Frontiers folks like Gohar Aftab and Hamad Anwar, they engage with the students and say, which character do you identify with? What do you think they should have said? So this is really important work. Is it, does this stop extremism? This is the way you do it. One step at a time. If you don't take those baby steps, you're not going to make the giant leap. So that's why I wanted to share the poetry of Hasina Gul today, because you can say, oh, it's just poetry, but it's having a profound impact on people's sensibilities in Khyber Pakhtanhua. I didn't say before that it was translated by um, Zenab, um, Zenab Adnan, and Anila Adnan. They helped me to translate from Pashto into English. So thank you very well, much, Bari Merhavani, that you've endured our panel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Trump and Professor Sahiba, for your valuable contribution to this conference. Uh, certainly, winding up the session, uh, we could say that what we could gather from these sessions was to, to rely more on creating awareness about national historical context that may lead towards national integration. Secondly, we should, be, we should believe in the transformation and this transformation must begin from here, right from here and then from here then, before using our hands, right? Uh, with this, I believe I should be ending up the session. Thank you so much for uh, your presence. Uh, before we say goodbye to our worthy guests, uh, as per our uh, tradition, conference tradition, uh, may I request uh, 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 Professor Dr. Naveed, Rector of Warfield University, to present the sheets, the, the souvenirs for the conference. Who so was the hero of this panel for getting my PowerPoint to get uploaded? <laughs>